This 10 past eight, and now a story that affects so many of us, so many families right across the country, because uh, around the UK, there are almost a million people living with some form of dementia. It's an illness which can impact your memory, your mood, even your movement. It can also come at a huge financial and emotional cost for the loved ones around you. So over the next few months, we're going to look at what it's like for caring with someone with dementia and what can be done to make things easier. And we're going to start with the story of someone you know only too well, our own friend and colleague, Nina, because Nina's dad, Chris, was diagnosed with dementia last year. And it was down to Nina and her sisters, Amy and Mel, to try to make some sense of it all. We're going to speak to Nina in just a moment, but first, here is her family's story. My dad is a funny man, is how I'd sum him up. Um, ever since being little, uh, he could give a little side eye at somebody, a stranger, that he would just know we'd all find funny and we would all collapse in laughter. And he can still do that, even after all these years. He's funny. That is probably a word that most people, his colleagues, his friends, his family, would use for him. He's very funny. And he's charming, he's a very charming man. He can still very much make me laugh. We can still make him laugh. That wit and humour is still very much there. Um, not sure we always know what we're laughing at or about, but um, the laughter is very much there. He's a really hard worker, and I think work was always very, very important to him. My dad is someone who has a very strict social conscience. He thinks a lot about doing the right thing. Letting people down is his absolute worst nightmare. He knows me, he knows my sisters. If I walk into the room, he can see in my eyes, he'll say something like, you look like you've been working too much, Angel, or you must have had a good sleep last night, and he will be right, because he still knows me, he still gets me, and he still has to just give that little side eye and I'll be in hysterics. <laughs> So what year is that photo? That's the boy. Who's that? Georgie. George Best. Yeah. What do you remember about him? Uh, I remember him lifting the European Cup. Yeah. You were friends with him? Oh, yeah. You used to go out with him? Yeah, yeah. We used to go to Old Trafford to watch United play. Yeah. And George Best would be there, wouldn't he, watching as well? And he always still came yeah. and, and said hello, didn't he? Oh, it was more than that. Those were the days, eh? Yeah, yeah. The thing that bonded me and my dad was I was the only girl who played football for the school team and in the league, and football became a huge part of our relationship and was for 30 years. Um, and now when I look back on it, I, I wonder whether I loved football that much or whether I just loved having that time, just me and him. Uh, and he was so, so proud to have his little girl play in a boys' league. When we knew the signs were coming in, um, yeah, it was so hard to get a diagnosis. Um, and I don't know why. Um, where do you start? Do we ring social services? Do we speak to the GP? We spoke to all those people and we weren't moving on. And we were like, what do we do? I remember literally screaming, what do I do? because nobody could help us. Nobody could help us. This is what I don't understand about dementia. So we had an incredibly engaged and switched on GP. His social care team was supportive and empathetic. When he ended up in emergency care, Salford Royal Hospital was amazing. He had three daughters who were engaged and wanted to do the best by him. And still, we collectively felt like we were in free fall. I remember I would go round in the day and make sure he'd had his morning medication and give him a hot lunch and then leave some a dinner for him to have in the evening. And then I'd go round the next day and the food would still be there and say, why haven't you eaten it, Dad? And he'd say, oh, I didn't know who that was for, even though he lived alone. On another occasion, he put a boxed pizza in the oven. On another occasion, he left his house in the middle of the night. So you're worried about safety. And until you have a clear diagnosis, you can't necessarily get all the support that you need. So you're left as a carer thinking, 
you're trying your best, but that you're failing everywhere. He was living in Manchester and I was living in Shrewsbury and I had two very young girls. I had full-time work and a husband and to try and juggle all of that was near impossible. And when I wasn't with him, I was thinking about him and it just takes over you completely. A really hard bit, and I feel guilty now when I think about it, is that he was getting on my nerves and having to do all these practical things was getting me down. And because of that stress, we stopped having nice times together. We stopped enjoying one another's company. And I feel like that last year when we had him at home, we won't get that back now. And that's really hard and I feel guilty about that. Yeah, I do feel really guilty about that, sorry. <laughs> Even then when you get the diagnosis, there is no clarity in the system about what happens next. You know, if we compare it to something else, if you have a cancer diagnosis or liver failure or heart failure, I think the pathway is quite clear. You will be directed and led along that pathway to specialists. Let's call this what it is. This is brain failure. And let's bring the same clarity that we have to other parts of our, our health and bodies that are failing us. Let's try and bring that clarity to a dementia diagnosis. Dirty old town. Dirty old town. Lovely. So it, it's been about a year now, hasn't it, since he moved in? Because he's yeah. been there since, yeah, February 2022. And is a lot more settled now, looking back to a year ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's because he's got the right care, isn't it? And we were absolutely doing our best. But, um, yeah, now all need to be in met. Um, got professionals caring for him. Um, and he looks, the whole world looks different, doesn't it? So when we do see him now, um, we have lovely we times. Have we can be his daughters, yeah. we can go out for lunch, have coffee, And cake. we're not doing his dentist appointments yeah. and his yeah. looking after him and, yeah. And that's, that makes the world that, a difference for all of us. That's the major difference that, that care gets you, yeah. I feel really positive now about the future with my dad because his basic needs are being met. He's in a wonderful care home. He has regular visits with us. He's resting a lot. He's physically looking well. And I know we have great times ahead of us. We had a big party for his 80th birthday and he only managed an hour, but it was a really special hour. And we've moved our expectations of what fun times with dad are, but there are plenty more of them to come. And dementia shouldn't be seen as this death sentence that's a tragedy with no good times to be had, because that's not true. We need to reconsider what dementia is and what living alongside dementia is. Nina's with us this morning on the sofa. Hiya, Hello. how are you doing? You I'm right? well, thank you. This is lovely. He would love this. The family <laughs> gallery, the Warhurst family yeah, gallery. Yeah, and his mum and dad there as well, who um, also lived with dementia. So, yeah, it's, um, it's really nice. I guess the first question is, kind of why was it so important for you and your sisters to sort of tell your dad's story? I think there's two reasons. The first is that we were surprised at how hard it was. Mm. You know, his parents had dementia, he was prepared for it, he expected it. So his house was in order, his paperwork was in order. We thought that transition would be as smooth as it could possibly be. But first of all, the diagnosis, so from the early signs that was some, something was wrong, it's a, a, a protracted process because they're monitoring someone's deterioration over a set period of time. And if they drop considerably in that time, it's stressful for the family and it becomes quite dangerous. That was really hard. But on, on top of that, you're taking over another adult's life. You're taking over their phone, their car insurance, their dental appointments, their audiology, their chiropody. So all of that life admin falls on your plate. And some organisations were really supportive and helpful and empathetic. And some, it was like banging your head against a brick wall. While you're looking after someone, as every dementia carer will know, who's asking a million questions at the time, and I had two tiny kids. So the collective mass of stress was huge. 
it was really huge and it's almost like the grief, the pain of I'm losing this person who I love. Mm. You haven't even got time for that. That's on the back burner because you're running on anxiety and adrenaline all the time. Yeah. And I know one of the challenges that families can have is that the the person who's been diagnosed, they can, they can change, their personality can change significantly, can't it? So that can be, all of these changes can be okay if they are cooperating and they're yeah. going along with you, but actually at times they might not want their life to change in this way or to move home or to give things away or even give control of their life away. And that's something that can be really tough, isn't it? Yeah, particularly, I mean, we've been quite fortunate that my dad has n never got particularly angry. And I know that can happen with different forms of dementia and really important to say everybody's dementia journey is completely different. But he didn't necessarily understand it was happening. So when we mooted conversations about changing the setup, maybe have, giving some respite care, he thought that nothing was wrong. So having to move him, it felt like it was against his will and having to tell little fibs all the time just broke your heart but it was in his best interest. And there were times when you did feel like, if I don't fib to him to get us over this hump, mm. we're not gonna get there. And he would phone me you know, 10 times a day, say, I need you to come round, I need you to come round. And I'd get there and he'd say, what are you doing here? And at that point, it's hard not to be cross. Mm. And, and you know, that's, that, that was the surprising thing I found talking about that period. I felt really guilty because I was like, just, I was getting angry with him. I was taking it out on him. And I had two tiny kids at home that I wasn't seeing as much and I wasn't focused at work. And there are these ripples on you as a daughter or a husband or a wife or a, a, a sibling that then go through your family as well. And you, you do, you feel like you're in free fall. You and your sisters have been fantastic though. I mean, you know, we. we have known about this and what you've done and the way you've looked after him has been remarkable. It's what anybody would want their family to do for them. And I, you know, that, that figure, a million people with dementia, yeah. you think of that, but then you think of a million families, the number of people, you know, many millions are across the country who are affected by dementia is enormous, isn't it? Yeah, and it, you know, it's, it's been good for me and my sisters. We sort of all realise that we're good at different things. My older sister is, is very practical. My younger sister is naturally empathetic and a carer. And so we've all assumed different roles. And, and now he's in a really great care home, thanks to Clive and the gang who look after him. Um, everything has shifted. You know, we, all three of us say we lost that parent-daughter dynamic that, you know, we laughed together as a family so much. We had so much fun together and it was lost because we were all in a state of panic, like high anxiety for a long time. And now he's happier, he's more mm. comfortable, he's less stressed. We can all assume those roles again and we're having a laugh again, like the Warhurst gang always used to. It's nice. He wouldn't be laughing about the football yesterday, though, would he? I can't believe you went there, John. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be giving you the side eye at that, that's for sure. Uh, your story has resonated enormously. We've had so many messages already, and we're going to let you know in a moment how you can get in touch. I want to read you some of these. This is from uh, Selena, who said, My mum was diagnosed with Alzheimer's three years ago. I'm contemplating having to leave my job and move nearer to her in the next year. It is devastating. Daniela said, my mum passed away from dementia in January last year. It's hard to see your loved one deteriorate in front of your eyes. My heart goes out to Nina and her sisters because so many of us know just how painful it is. Yeah. And yeah, it is that practical thing of how do I make sure they're safe? And on top of that, if you're looking for a care home, the financial impact is absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. We're in a position where we've been able to rent out his house and then subsidise his care with his savings. But that will come to an end. That won't last forever. And then there are big decisions about where the funding comes from beyond that point. It's really difficult. And I do want to say that there is these happy times that we foresee mm. now. Mm. And people say things like, why don't you take him to a dementia coffee morning or a keep fit club? And you think, no, that's not him actually. Just because he's got dementia, he's not this individual that we perceive as being a dementia patient. Mm. He's still Chris, he's still my dad. He'd hate a coffee morning with strangers. He always would have. <laughs> so we have to remember and respect them as individuals that they remain. And every story is different, as you said. Every story is different, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, Nina, thank you so much to you and, and your sisters and your dad for, for that film.
Um, and we would love to hear your stories and share some more of those over the weeks ahead. Now, if you've cared for someone with dementia, we want to hear what it's been like for you and your family. There's a new way to contact us at BBC Breakfast. You can now send us a message on WhatsApp. The number is 0330 123 0440 or just scan the QR code with your phone's camera and that will automatically start a chat with us. Yes, yeah, clever that, isn't it? You just open your camera on your phone, zoom it at that barcode on the left-hand side and it will set it all up. Then if you save BBC Breakfast in your WhatsApp contacts, you can get in touch with us, not just on this story, but any story in the future. And you can get in touch the usual old ways as well. Yeah, the old ways now, the email, ways. <laughs> email, email and Twitter. Email and Twitter are now old, old school, yeah. Uh, details there. BBC Breakfast at bbc.co.uk and at BBC Breakfast on Twitter. And do please include your name as well, your family name, if you're happy to do so, and then we'll read out more of your stories and return to that. Thank you, Nina. Yeah. Really good, thank you. Breakfast is here on BBC One until a quarter past nine this morning when Morning Live takes over. And this morning, Gabby and Gethin will be there for us and tell us now what they've got planned. Good morning, both of you. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you and lots of love from us to Nina and her family Absolutely. too.